Hello everybody. My name is Daryl Cartwright and I'm an estate planning attorney based in Birmingham, Alabama in the Vestavia Hills area. And today I wanted to talk to you about some ancillary documents that help comprise an effective estate plan. These documents are not your last will and testament, but documents that I believe should be part of any good estate plan, be part of your toolkit that you have that accompany your last will and testament. Let's take a look at those and talk about it. Ancillary documents you need. The ones we're gonna talk about today are principally the four that I've highlighted here. A general durable power of attorney, a healthcare proxy or healthcare power of attorney, an advance directive or living will, and funeral and burial instructions document. Now, in my mind, those are the four staple items that need to be included in every good estate plan in, uh, in, in Alabama. But there are some other miscellaneous documents that I'm gonna briefly reference at the end of the presentation today that your attorney may or may not discuss with you in the event that it is appropriate. Those documents are not appropriate for every individual or every couple. However, the ones we're going to talk about today really are. The general durable power of attorney is the first document. Now, you may hear people call this a financial power of attorney, and they would be principally right. The general durable power of attorney relates to financial and legal matters. It allows you, as the principal, to appoint someone else as your agent to act for you to basically exercise the same kind of powers that you could exercise in the event that you're not, you're not exercising those powers yourself. Now, under Alabama law, you can have either a springing power of attorney or a sprung power of attorney. The difference is when the power of attorney becomes effective. Under a springing power of attorney, which is the one that I recommend for most clients, the power of attorney does not become effective unless and until the principal becomes incompetent or incapacitated. That's when it's really needed. That's when you need your agent to act for you. You don't need them to act for you before that time. Hence, the sprung power of attorney is one that I generally do not recommend. I'll do it in certain circumstances, such as a very elderly uh, client who perhaps has one son or one daughter, and they are the natural uh, person to act for them. Perhaps the client is advanced in, uh, in age and is starting to show some signs of uh, some mental deficiencies. When those things occur, perhaps a, a sprung power of attorney could be recommended. With a springing power of attorney, however, when the person becomes incompetent, the agent can act for them. In addition to that, the springing power of attorneys that I use also include a certificate of authorization. The certificate of authorization is a provision that allows the principal, you, to basically convert the springing power of attorney into a sprung power of attorney. Perhaps we sign the springing power of attorney now and uh, five years goes by and you are um, perhaps older, perhaps having physical and perhaps mental issues, but you're still not incompetent. However, you're just tired of having to do the things that you have to do yourself to manage your financial or legal affairs. In that case, you can take action yourself by signing that certificate of authorization, appointing your agent at that time, signing it in front of a notary public, and then it becomes effective immediately. So you have the best of both worlds. It's not effective immediately as sort of a convenience kind of thing only. It's only effective when you decide it or if you become incompetent. 
The next document is the healthcare proxy or healthcare power of attorney. Now, healthcare proxy is a document that is similar in many ways to a financial general durable power of attorney that is springing, not a sprung one, but a springing one. And the reason I say that is because in the event that you can make healthcare decisions for yourself, you'll make them. However, if you are incapable of making those healthcare decisions and your medical providers are looking to someone to make medical decisions for you, that's when this medical healthcare proxy will come into play. You're appointing an agent to make decisions for you in the event that you cannot make them for yourself. Now, one thing that I didn't mention on the power of attorney, but it applies to the power, general durable power of attorney, just as it does with a healthcare proxy. And that is, you can name one person, usually if there's a husband and wife, you name the spouse, and then you can name a successor agent. Perhaps your spouse uh, predeceases you. Perhaps your spouse is not competent or capable of handling those duties. You can go ahead and identify that successor agent in both cases. In fact, you can name as many of them as you feel comfortable in naming. First successor agent, second successor, successor agent, et cetera. I generally recommend that you try very hard to identify at least one successor agent just in case it's, it's needed. The third document that I wanted to mention is either an advanced directive or a living will. Now, this is a little bit where I differ from some attorneys. Uh, our legislature enacted a statutory form advanced directive for healthcare. And it's a document that kind of tries to do all different things. It, it at some point is a healthcare proxy and at some point it's a sort of living will. In my opinion, it doesn't do every, either one of them the way that it should. And there's some possibilities of some conf, uh, conflicting type of instructions in the document. You can check one box indicating that you want nutrition or hydration or you don't. And there's another box that kind of contradicts that. And it can be confusing for your medical providers, in my opinion. Now, for some people, it's still appropriate and we'll discuss it. And if it's appropriate for you, then that's what we'll use. However, for others, we simply use the healthcare proxy and a living will or a declaration with respect to certain medical services. And that's a document that says in the event that you have a terminal condition for which there is no hope of recovery, it is your desire to die naturally without the use of machines to artificially prolong your life. That's a personal choice. That's not something I recommend or I don't recommend but if that's consistent with your wishes, we put that in. The last document that we want to talk about is a document that not a lot of people know about, and it's called a funeral and burial instructions document. And that document allows you to identify not only uh, how you want your funeral to take place or whether you wish to be buried or cremated, etc., but also the person charged with the responsibility for disposing of your remains consistent with your wishes. This document is particularly useful in the event that you don't have a surviving spouse. Your spouse has predeceased you, you're a single uh, person. Uh, it allows you to identify the, the person that will carry out your wishes and can clarify any confusion or avoid any confusion among others that can do, um, that might be charged with the, the responsibility of disposing of your remains. Now, I'm going to briefly mention, I'm not really going to discuss some other documents just because if you're meeting with me, we may raise them if they are appropriate for your situation. If you're meeting with your other, your own attorney, and your own attorney may also address these. And that includes things such as a 
revocable trust or a revocable living trust. A lot of times we call it a living trust, often used with a pour over will. Uh, an irrevocable life insurance trust, or even just an irrevocable trust in general, special needs trust, or a spendthrift trust, contract to make a will. I've done several of those recently. It's worked very, very well for my clients. And then documents that are relate to uh, Medicaid planning or VA planning, such as Medicaid asset protection letter or Medicaid asset protection trust, caregiver, caregiver agreements, and more. In any event, those documents are not necessarily appropriate for your situation. The ones that I mentioned before and we discussed, I highly recommend and I'm going to encourage you as my estate planning clients to consider and allow me to help you implement those for your good and effective estate plan. Thank you for watching and I'll see you later.